Throughout the 18th century, Liverpool was controlled by men like Blundell, the traders, businessmen and merchants who made up the corporation. It was a closed shop of cronies, unelected sons who succeeded their fathers on point of death. They looked after the town's needs, but chiefly they looked after their own. In the three decades since Blundell built the blue coat, Liverpool had prospered to such an extent it needed a new symbol of civic identity. This is Liverpool Town Hall. The chosen architect was the fashionable designer John Wood of Bath. Wood's buildings were essays in the style of one of the most influential architects of all time, the 16th century Italian genius Andrea Palladio. An important principle of Palladian buildings is that they're bound by symmetry, geometry and number in firm proportion. They're about the creation of order using a flexible repertoire of classical elements. And what better way to convince the people of your town that you're in control than to make an example of order in the design of your town hall? In this case, the typical features are these, the rusticated base which elevates the main rooms up to the first floor level called the Piano Nobile. The use of the classical column on the side to give a sense of meter and rhythm and proportion. One really crucial feature, and this is what Palladio is quite famous for, is the application of a temple front to a building. It gives it a sense of centrality, of balance and nobility, and positioned at the end of Castle Street, this is a monument Liverpool couldn't ignore. But the new town hall wasn't all order and restraint. To glance between the sculpted capitals is to go on a virtual safari as you encounter a crocodile, an elephant, a lion and hyenas, not to mention the heads of African characters. Clearly in the 1740s, the slave trade was nothing to be embarrassed about. It was to be shouted from the rooftops to all people for all time. But neither the slaves whose sweat paid for this building, nor the workers whose sweat actually built it, were ever allowed inside. Everything that lay beyond that front door was strictly off limits to all but the city elite. John Wood's fine town hall marked the heart of modern Liverpool. The exchange on the ground floor and these reception rooms above are simply two sides of the same golden coin because those same merchants who traded in the daytime traded the business of politics in these rooms in the evening. Wood's name lent cachet to the project. He was commissioned to create a building both functional and seductive where Liverpool's legendary corporate hospitality could grease the wheels of trade. Now, Joseph, to what extent was this town hall a, a real seat of government? Well, municipal government in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century was on a much more modest scale uh, from what we're used to today. Um, so the government of the town was confined to a few rooms on the ground floor of the building. Um, but the most important function of the building was on the first floor and was the provision of space for entertainment, a suite of rooms for banqueting, for balls um, and meetings of that kind. So tell us how this place was used for entertaining. Well, Liverpool was a great commercial centre, had a constant stream of VIP visitors from overseas, um, and this is the place where they were entertained by the town, and so there were constantly parties and balls and things of that kind taking place in these rooms. 
One thing that strikes me, Joseph, about this town hall is that if you compared it to a building in, let's say, Florence or Rome, it is essentially a palace, isn't it? It's a palazzo. It's a square building with the noise and the dirt of commerce at the ground floor. And elevated above it is this grand suite of rooms with gilding and formal reception and so on. I mean, this is a grand mercantile palace, isn't it? Yes, I think what you just described is, is, is true, and it's, um, it's a kind of microcosm of, of Liverpool, um, this uh, affluent lifestyle of, for the few uh, based on uh, commercial activity at a lower level. Palladio was from the Republic of Venice, an independent city-state which derived its wealth and its power from its position as a strategic trading port. It may be no accident that Liverpool chose the Palladian style for its town hall. The northern towns could never compete architecturally with London, but by emulating other great cities of the past, they sent out a message as to how they wished to be seen. It's tempting to walk past this fine town hall and think of 18th century Liverpool as simply a place of growth and prosperity, but for some contemporary observers it had a serious image problem. was a short-lived decorative arts and architecture movement that existed originally in Europe from the late 19th and early 20th centuries and would then extend further out into the world. The advent of Art Nouveau can be traced to two distinct influences. The first was the introduction at around 1880 of the arts and crafts movement led by English designer William Morris. The second was the current vogue for Japanese art particularly wood block prints that swept up many European artists in the 1880s and 90s, including the likes of Gustav Klimt, Emile Gallet, and James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Art Nouveau was aimed at modernizing design in an attempt to break away from the eclectic historical styles that focus way too much on excessive and frivolous ornamentation, <coughs> Victorian, <coughs> that had previously been popular. Now with designers drawing inspiration from both organic and geometric forms, showcasing elegant designs that combined natural flowing forms with hard edged angular forms. The movement wanted to abolish the long existing hierarchy of the arts that viewed the liberal arts of painting and sculpture as superior to craft based decorative arts and make the latter receive more of the influence and the focus. The style went out of fashion after it gave way to the Art Deco movement of the 1920s, but it experienced a popular revival in the 1960s and is now seen as an important predecessor of modernism. Okay, so that's some of the basics about Art Nouveau as a whole, but you know what the second part of this episode is. We're going to dig into the nitty gritty of what made the Art Nouveau movement what it was. It's hard to point out the first works of art that officially launched Art Nouveau, but some believe that the trademark pattern flowing lines and floral backgrounds found in the paintings of Vincent van Gogh and Paul Gergen represent the birth of the Art Nouveau style. Others point out that the decorative lithographs of Henri de Telerousse de Trec, such as La Goule at the Moulin Rouge, and other decorative arts, particularly a book jacket, if you believe this, by English designer and architect Arthur Haygate McMurdo from the 1883 volume Wren City Churches. These designs depict serpentine stalks of flowers coming together into one whiplashed stalk at the bottom of the page, clearly reminiscent of the aforementioned Japanese style wood block prints. Along with the graphic and visual arts, Art Nouveau architecture had a vast influence on European culture as urban hubs like Paris, Prague, and Vienna, and Eastern European cities like Riga, Budapest, and Sevged, Hungary, presented and treated Art Nouveau inspired architecture on a grand scale in terms of both size and appearance. Turn of the century buildings that are prime examples that showcase Art Nouveau's decorative and symmetrical architectural aesthetic include, but are not limited to, the Museum of Applied Arts in Budapest and the Secession Building in Vienna. We'll get to that a little bit later. During the same time period, urban improvements like subway stations were highly visible projects that provided an important outlook for Art Nouveau designers, like Hector Guimard's designs for the entrances to the Paris subway, which are quite possibly the best examples of the Art Nouveau style. The Vienna Secessionists, a collective of visual artists, decorators, sculptors, architects, and designers who sought to popularize 
and spread the Art Nouveau style initially banded together in 1897 to promote their own work and organize exhibitions that resisted the conservatism that still prevailed in so many of Europe's traditional art academies. Arguably, the most prolific and influential of the successionists was painter Gustav Klimt, whose use of the elaborate decorations in his paintings, including silver and gold leaf, and rhythmic abstractions, created such definitive examples of early modernism as Hope II and The Kiss, arguably some of the most revered examples of the Art Nouveau style. The successionists desire to abandon the historical styles of the 19th century was an important impetus behind Art Nouveau and one that establishes the movement's modernism as industrial production at that point was widespread and since the decorative arts were increasingly dominated by poorly made objects that imitated earlier periods, the pioneers of Art Nouveau aimed to revive good workmanship, raise the status of the craft, and produce genuinely modern design. Many supporters of the Art Nouveau style claimed that the academic system that had dominated art education from the 17th to the 19th century created a widespread belief that such media as paintings and sculpture were superior to crafts like furniture design and silversmithing. Their case was that this focus by the existing academic system resulted in a neglect of good craftsmanship. So Art Nouveau artists and supporters aimed to overturn that belief focusing on a quote-unquote total works of the arts. The infamous Gestamt Kunstwerk that inspired buildings and interiors in which every element partook of the same visual vocabulary. Even though the term Art Nouveau was the movement's most commonly used name, its wide popularity throughout Western and Central Europe meant that it went by several different titles, including the aforementioned Vienna Succession. The most well-known of these was Jugendstil, or Youth Style, as the styles were known in German-speaking countries. It was also known in Spain as Modernismo, in Stile Liberty in Italy after Author Liberty's fabric shop in London, which helped popularize the style and some derogatory names like Style Nouille or Noodle Style in France, Paling Stigil or Eel Style in Belgium, and Bandworm Steel Tapeworm. It's associated with the work from its launch as Deputy Inspector. But Dubon was awarded the Prix de Rome in 1823 and set off for a five-year stay at the Villa Medicis. The Prix de Rome was the school's most prestigious award, a single student chosen each year in each discipline to whom the Academy offered a five-year stay in Rome and, above all, the guarantee of an official career on his return. The architects had to carry out the archaeological survey of a ruin and imagine what the building would have looked like in its heyday. Dubon picked the Octavian Portico as his subject, a collection of sparse ruins in the Rome ghetto. This wasn't by chance. The Octavian ruins are those of a school, a scuola, in the ancient meaning of the word. In other words, an intellectual center that includes two temples, a library, and schools. Dubon noted that the temples were similar to museums, containing masterpieces from ancient Greece. Shortly after his return from Rome, Dubon was named as the architect to the Fine Arts School, thanks to the 1830 revolution. The new regime wished to fall into line with the mood of the times, Romanticism, and Dubon was picked out for his support of the Romantic literary movement. The authorities were counting on him to give a new lease of life to a project that had hardly made any headway in 13 years. Dubon, who had reconstructed the plans of the Octavian Portico, would take his inspiration from them to design his own plan for the Fine Arts School. It wasn't an easy task. Dubon inherited a complete layout and unfinished buildings on a plot of land trapped in the city and without street access. He decided to clear the area in front of the palace obstructed by the older buildings. He demolished the small cloister, made a compulsory purchase order on the houses along the street, and, to clear the way for the palace, moved back the alignment of the large cloister that he rebuilt in his own manner.
Having clarified the space in this manner, Dubon reorganized the distribution of the school's buildings and assigned three distinct functions to the three buildings on the site. The cloister at the entrance would be used for classes and for different services and stores. The building at the rear, known as the Loggia building, would be used solely for exams. And the main building, thus freed of all trivial functions, would become the study museum that could house the collections, a library, and a hall for prize giving. Debray had designed a palace. Dubon retained its outline but transformed the facade. Dubon had several loves. Rome, but also Florence, a city that he had discovered during his travels in Italy and whose old palaces he greatly admired. The facade of the study museum is a copy of the Florentine palaces with their rustic stonework, exposed stone, and large arched windows. Orders lend rhythm to the facade on its upper floors. Inside, the study museum also has the structure of a Florentine palace with open galleries overlooking a large courtyard. Originally, the courtyard was open to the sky. But with the growth of the collections, Dubon had to use the courtyard area by covering it with a large glass canopy. He made the most of this new area to supplement the models on offer to the students, with full-scale models of the columns of the Parthenon and those of the Temple of Jupiter Stator in Rome. These columns were so tall, 22 meters, that a trap door had to be led into the ground to accommodate them. The trap door is still there, but the casts of ancient works were shattered in May 1968 and have been removed. By displaying these models that have now vanished, Dubon wanted to make copying a spiritual experience, as if he wanted to urge his students on, according to his biographer, and tell them, Believe me, you young architects who form the majority at the fine arts school, you will one day use painters and sculptors. You will exert on them the influence that every creator exerts on those with whom he chooses to work. Return to simplicity and grandeur. Here is the secret of proportion in great art. Do not copy them, but let these examples be a constant reminder of the laws that must govern us. Instead of copying the work of others, create. Become natural writers of this fine universal language called architecture. Dubon didn't stop at exposing models within these walls. The walls, too, became a museum. On the ceiling of the first floor galleries, the teachers of painting at the school requested copies of the Vatican Loggias. Dubon seized this opportunity to go even further and refurbish the whole gallery. In order to reconstruct a little of the grandeur of the Vatican lodges that extend over 13 arches, Dubon copied Raphael's decoration for the walls. Since he didn't have windows or the means of using stucco, he opted for a trompe l'oeil decor in tempera, known for its resistance. In this way, recounts his biographer, he offered a thousand students in Paris the joys that only the successors of Pope Leo X could feel each day on passing through such a gallery. On the stairways of the building, Dubon exposed all the available materials and the different ways of decorating a wall. This brought him harsh criticism. The main staircase is merely a sample card. 
All these marble slabs recessed into the walls have barely more value in the eyes of a man of taste than Harlequin's costume. Monsieur Dubon's work lacks unity. The builder of the fine arts school has never created anything. For him, inventing and remembering are the same thing. However, in this eclecticism, the critics didn't perceive an attempt to bring the countless elements together in order to fire the student's imagination. At the top of the wall, another reference. The panels recall the baptistry in Florence.
1,046 feet, it towers over one of the busiest intersections in midtown Manhattan. It is one of the tallest buildings in the world and remains a favorite among residents and visitors alike. There are many taller buildings, but it's the only one that starts out at the street and meets the sky with that kind of panache. I think it's probably the strongest punctuation in the skyline. Chrysler even once said he wanted people to walk into his building and marvel. And that's why the design of it is so extravagant, so opulent. Completed in 1930 at a cost of $15 million for auto tycoon Walter P. Chrysler, the Chrysler Building was the tallest structure on Earth for 11 months, until the Empire State Building topped it by 204 feet. The Chrysler Building may no longer be the tallest, but what it lacks in height, it more than makes up for in style. Its lighted set of receding curves, eagles, and Chrysler hubcaps make the skyscraper different from anything built before or after. I'm a car buff, and that's the part of the building that brings it all together. It's the Chrysler building, and that's what Walter Chrysler did. He built automobiles. The radiator caps on the 31st floor were modeled from car ornaments on the 1926 Chrysler. But it's not just the automobile designs and eagles that make this skyscraper one of a kind. Inside, there are even more surprises. When you go into those dark black marble doors, you find yourself in a triangular lobby where there are entrances and exits on several sides of the triangle. And you find yourself in a deeply atmospheric environment the lobby is theatrically lit and decorated with stainless steel and granites and marbles from around the world. The lobby is just a work of art of uh, the most exotic uh, African tile and stainless steel and uh, chandeliers and uh, an early version of a digital clock. Very space age. On the ceiling, a massive mural, 110 feet by 79 feet. It's one of the largest murals in the country and features images circa 1930 of progress, transportation, and energy. There's also a lavish marble staircase that leads to a shopping arcade and subways. Another unusual feature of the lobby are the elevators. There are 32 elevator cabs, each different, each custom designed. One of the first things you'll notice is the beautiful wood on the elevator cars. There's American walnut, there's um, oriental walnut, there's satin wood. It's beautiful. It's absolutely fabulous. The elevators carry thousands of workers each morning to 71 floors of offices. More than 80 businesses call the Chrysler Building home ranging from financial firms to dental offices. In the deeper reaches of the building are the electrical systems and heating and cooling units. All have been updated to accommodate the demands of 21st century tenants. But the building still retains vestiges of the decade it was born, the Roaring Twenties. In the 1920s, lots of things were happening because there was a business revival in Europe and the United States after recovery from the First World War. With a business revival, you could expect that there would be a need for new buildings. In the mid-1920s, plans were in the works for a skyscraper over 60 floors high at the corner of 42nd Street and Lexington Avenue, the future site of the Chrysler Building. There was a project started by a guy named William H. Reynolds, who had no experience whatsoever in tall building construction. I think he must have floated this idea simply to sell the project. He was an amusement park developer. He built a ride called Fire and Flames in the last days of Pompeii. And so he definitely had a stunt mentality. Reynolds hired New York architect William Van Allen, who was known more for designing unusual shops and restaurants than anything else. 
To be perfectly honest, he was not regarded before the Chrysler building as anything more than simply a clever designer. Furthermore, Van Allen had never built anything taller than a few stories. Yet he seized this project in earnest. Van Allen had prepared a scheme for the building which didn't have that signature top to it, but it already had that patterning, this amazing uh, contrast of horizontal and vertical on the lower floors, like a basket weave, and then the uh, upper floors with all those indentations. There was a reason for the indentations and setbacks. New York City's 1916 zoning law. Buildings were allowed now to rise only up to a certain height, and then they had to set back in a series of steps, like a, a sort of wedding cake tower or boxes piled one on top of the other, in order to allow for light to come down into the streets. Van Allen was also limited by standard building conventions. In a time before air conditioning and fluorescent lighting, workers needed access to fresh air and light. Van Allen placed all offices on the perimeter near the windows and all elevators and utility areas in the center. He had drawn countless sketches, but they were going nowhere. Imagine what it's like to be an architect who is drawing these wonderful designs for the great building that's going to be the pinnacle of his career, and yet there's no money to build it. And to know that William Reynolds probably had no intention of actually building it. Then in 1928, automobile tycoon Walter P. Chrysler decided he wanted to I'll look that up. Susan, we got an introduction. I think. Tim is going to, Tim will think about it and see what he thinks. Okay, so the introduction would be to set the stage, the context of New York as the capital of the political and cultural world of the third quarter of the 20th century, that you have a series of buildings, starting with the Museum of Modern Art, which is the first museum built exclusively for modern art and in the new international style. Then you have the United Nations headquarters, which established New York as the political capital of the new global world, which was in part designed by Le Corbusier. Then you have the Seagram building, which was designed by Mies van der Rohe and became the most refined and beautiful model for corporate architecture in the world. And then into this mix, right in the middle of it all, comes Frank Lloyd Wright, who is completely outside this mainstream of established modern architects, who gets the chance to build in New York his dream building, which he then takes and runs with. And he builds a building in the city he supposedly despised for a kind of program which he supposedly despised, meaning New York and modern art, and makes a building that becomes the building that people come to visit New York for and to see modern art in. What a guy. What a building. The ironies of life. <laughs> That's great. I like that. See, we'll get into it. Trust me. <laughs> Someone once asked me what's the single most important object in the Guggenheim collection, and it's clearly the building. Even if you see it in photographs, you cannot understand it until you walk through it. I've always had a love affair with the Guggenheim. The way it soars is thrilling beyond belief. It undoes and subverts everything you know about what a building's supposed to do. Here we have people. People are making the walls. People are moving in the fabric of the building. And the building is part of them. It's a strange and wonderful feeling. The building, as it was being constructed, ignored the neighborhood. Conventional wisdom at that time would have looked at it as a Martian. 
nice thing about time is it heals all of that, and today it looks like it was there first, and all the others are Martian. There are very few buildings that have the right, I think, to lay claim to being the most important works of architecture of the 20th century, and the Guggenheim Museum by Frank Lloyd Wright is one of them.